Meeting of the Monday, April 15th, Monona City Council. Will the clerk please call the roll? Alder Kitzler? Here. Alder Coor? Or Alder Coor is excused. Oh. She's going to be a little late. I'm sorry. I'm um, sorry. Alder Groupie? Here. Alder Moore? Here. Alder Spate? Here. Alder Wood? Here. Mayor O'Connor? Here. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, is there a motion to approve the minutes of the April 1st meeting? I move to approve. Any corrections or additions? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Minutes are approved. Uh, there are two proclamations in the appearances section tonight, which I will just read. Uh, the first is a proclamation recognizing April 26, 2019 as Arbor Day in the city of Monona. Whereas in 1872, J. Sterling Morton proposed to the Nebraska Board of Agriculture that a special day be set aside for the planting of trees, and whereas this holiday, called Arbor Day, was first observed with the planting of more than a million trees in Nebraska, and Arbor Day is now observed throughout the nation and the world, and whereas trees are a renewable resource giving us paper, wood for our homes, fuel for our fires, and countless other wood products, and whereas trees in our city increase property values, enhance the economic vitality of business areas, and beautify our committee, and whereas our community, and whereas the city of Monona has been recognized as a tree city USA by the National Arbor Day Foundation and desires to continue its tree planting practices. Now therefore I, Mary Kay O'Connor, Mayor of the City of Monona, Dane County, Wisconsin, do hereby proclaim Friday, April 26, 2019 as Arbor Day in the city of Monona and urge all citizens to celebrate Arbor Day and to support efforts to protect our trees and woodland. Further, I urge all citizens to plant trees to gladden the heart and promote the well-being of this and future generations. Signed in the city of Monona, Dane County, Wisconsin, this 15th day of April 2019, Mary O'Connor, Mayor. Then we have a second proclamation recognizing May 11, 2019 as International Migratory Bird Day in the city of Monona. Whereas migratory birds are some of the most beautiful and easily observed wildlife in our communities, and whereas many citizens recognize and welcome migratory songbirds as symbolic harbingers of spring, and whereas these migrant species also play an important economic role in our community, controlling insect pests and generating millions in recreational dollars statewide, and whereas migratory birds and their habitats are declining throughout the Americas, facing a growing number of threats on their migration routes, and in both their summer and winter homes, and whereas since 1993, International Migratory Bird Day has become a primary vehicle for focusing public attention on the nearly 350 species that travel between nesting habitats in our communities and throughout North America and their wintering grounds in South and Central America, Mexico, the Caribbean, and the Southern U.S., and whereas hundreds of thousands of people will observe Inter International Migratory Bird Day, gathering in town squares, community centers, schools, parks, and nature centers to learn about birds, take action to conserve them, and simply to have fun. Now therefore, be it resolved that I, Mary Kay O'Connor, Mayor, do hereby proclaim May 11, 2019 as International Migratory Bird Day in the city of Monona, Dane County, Wisconsin, and I urge all citizens to celebrate this observance and to support efforts to protect and conserve migratory birds and their habitats in our community and the world at large. Signed in the city of Monona, Dane County, Wisconsin, this 15th day of April, 2019, Mary Kay O'Connor, Mayor. All right, um, there I do have two uh, letters that we've received. I thought maybe the council had received these, but apparently not from the way they've been addressed. Uh, one from former Mayor Bob Miller um, contacting us in support of two items on the agenda related to the Riverfront pro uh, project. I'm just going to read parts of these. Um, Bob continues to um, follow our council meetings via uh, YouTube, apparently quite routinely. Um, he would like to register his strong support for both the renaming of Metropolitan Lane to Inland Way and providing the naming rights to Monona Bank for the new skating rink. Inland Boats had a long history of boat manufacturing and service to area boaters for decades along that portion of the Ihara River. The street name Inland Way is a fitting way to reflect that legacy and location. 
Monona Bank also has a long history of supporting its hometown. Monona Bank is always the go-to business for every city fundraising event and always provides either financial or staff support for these events. <coughs> With this substantial de donation to help defray some of the costs of the skating rink, I support providing the naming rights to Monona Bank. Uh, I suppose I can't resist this. And on a more humorous note, I see an agenda item regarding communication needs and redefining the city's logo. I am sure I still have in storage a few copies of the infamous logo design, Monona, greener, bluer, brighter, <laughs> that I would be happy to share. Uh, thanks for all you do. And then we have a second letter from Steve uh, Dorn, uh, also writing in support of renaming Metropolitan in to Inland Way. Uh, there is no further, further correlation or meaning to the Metropolitan Lane as it relates to this site or project, as that was named after Metropolitan Bank. Inland is a much more fitting name as it reflects history as well as ties in with the Ahara River. Uh, he's also in support of the naming rights for the Nona, Monona Bank. Ice Arena Monona Bank has been key to the success and development of this project. They have continuously provided support for projects in Monona and will undoubtedly continue to be a great business resident for, residence for our city. I couldn't think of a better way to help the city minimize expenses for the operation of the ice rink while allowing our hometown bank some advertising and recognition. So Joan, if you wanna put, take care of those. Um, okay, there is no public hearing. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Move to approve the consent agenda. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Consent agenda is approved. Uh, item G1A, unfinished business, consideration of resolution 19-4-2346, award of bid for city hall and library HVAC upgrades put forth by the public works director. S or Brad, I guess is gonna speak on this. Is there a motion to approve this? Move approval. Second. Okay, Brad. Both of these are on, so that's good. Um, so Dan presented this at the first council meeting of the month. Um, this is for a uh, total bid amount for general air conditioning or heating and air conditioning for 77200 The budgeted amount was $174,000 um, uh, with $6,000 for cash allowances for any unforeseen items that might come up during construction. So with that, I'll open up to questions. Uh, one thing I did mention in um, finance and personnel is that in the first whereas in the resolution says this right. is to complete HVAC upgrades. It's really, we agreed to <coughs> change that to continue upgrades. So there's a lot more to be done here. Uh, anyone else have any questions? Nope. Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Uh, Joan, does this need a? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. Much you everything please? on the agenda tonight will require a roll. Okay. Would you please call the roll? Alder Wood. Aye. Alder Kitzler. Aye. Alder, I'm sorry, Alder Groupie. Aye. Alder Moore. Aye. Alder Spade. Aye. Motion passes. Item 1B, consideration of resolution 19-4-2341, award of bid for 2019 microsurfacing project put forth by the Public Works Committee. Is there a motion to approve this? Move to approve. Second. Dan? Okay, thank you. Uh, this appears uh, for the second reading tonight. Uh, the Public Works Committee did approve this at the April 3rd meeting. Um, there's no other additions or updates uh, unless there's questions. Questions, anyone? Will the clerk please call the roll? I'm sorry, I'm got it. Yes, uh, <laughs> Alder Spate. Aye. Alder Wood. Aye. Alder Kitzler. Aye. Alder Groupie. Aye. Alder Moore. Aye. A motion passes. Uh, item C, consideration of resolution 19-4-2342, award of bid for Winnequa Park Lagoon improvements, also put forth by the Public Works Committee. Is there a motion, motion to approve this? Move approval. Second. Dan? Okay, thank you. Uh, this is well uh, received uh, recommended approval from the Public Works Committee on April 3rd. Tonight at the finance meeting, Alder Wood asked about uh, uh, restoration for the shoreline. Uh, those items include uh, riprap uh, for the majority of the channel. There's uh, um, vegetated uh, boulder. Um, that, that's where we have uh, boulders with uh, gaps of vegetation uh, for approximately 110 feet of shoreline. We have two areas where we're putting in stone steps 
along the shoreline. There's going to be money dedicated to a goose fence, which is just a natural vegetation. And then uh, we have some fish habitat that's going to be put in as well. So about uh, a <coughs> little over 100000 for this uh, dedicated shoreline improvements to the channel. Any questions? Andrew? Uh, at Finance and Personnel, you mentioned there was a canoe uh, entry yep. point. And I don't know if Jake wanted That was in there oh. initially, but that did, did not go in the final bid. So I'm okay. just on that. All right. We were wondering where the canoes went yeah. after they got in. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Will the clerk please call the roll? Alder Moore? Aye. Alder Spate? Aye. Alder Wood? Aye. Alder Kitzler? Aye. Alder Groupie? Aye. Motion passes. Item D, consideration of resolution 19-4-2343, approval of observation and administration services proposal from Strand Associates for the North Winnequa Park Lagoon improvements put forth by the Public Works Committee. Is there a motion to approve this? Move to approve. Second. Dan. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is here for the second read tonight as well. Uh, the only change uh, from the first read is that the Public Works Committee did vote on this, gave it recommended approval on April 3rd. Otherwise, uh, if there's any questions. Questions? Will the clerk please call the roll? Alder Groupie? Aye. Alder Moore? Aye. Alder Spate? Aye. Alder Wood? Aye. Alder Kitzler? Aye. Alder Coor? Is not here. I cannot <laughs> remember that. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Motion passes. Item 1E, consideration of resolution 19-4-2344, award of bid for 2019 Bridge Road Improvements Project. Is there a motion also put forth by the Public Works Committee? Is there a motion to approve this? Move approval. Thanks. Dan? Okay, thank you. Um, this is here for the second read. Uh, there was one addition. Um, Alder Kitzlar requested another whereas be put in, uh, which we did. Uh, it states $1.497 million uh, will be allocated to the city of Monona, and then $842,714 will be the city of Madison's cost as part of this bid. Now, the Public Works Committee also recommended approval of this bid at the April 3rd meeting. Dan, do you want to explain a little more about the cost of the undergrounding and how that might actually sure. take this a little bit over budget? Sure. Um, during the uh, planning phase, uh, prior to the uh, 2018 rain events that we had in August and September, um, on the fiscal note, I did uh, some explanation there as far as what I had in the capital budget request versus the bid amount and other expenses that we received. You'll see that the storm sewer, uh, we had allocated $20,000, and that was based off a 15-year rain event. Um, we were not yet in final design when we had the, uh, the heavy rains at the end of August into September. And basically we had a 100 year uh, rain event. So we went back to the drawing board while we still had time. We accounted for a 100 year rain event. Reason being is because the majority of the water comes from the city of Madison. It would come down Bridge Road. It would take a right down Metropolitan. Uh, with the city investing millions of dollars in the riverfront development, I'd be ashamed to have uh, to send 100-year flood waters down a new v development. Um, so what we did was we accounted for all of that 100-year uh, uh, rain event to put it underground. So it's going to go in pipes instead of the surface. Um, so you see the storm sewer went from 20,000 in our planning up to 101,000 in the bid. Uh, the other item that we had um, a rising cost versus the planning was the bridge enhancements. Uh, we had planned for $350,000 in cost. The bid came in at $551,000. Uh, reason being, uh, the bridge contractors are busy, and uh, Hamburg received one, one subcontractor bid for it. So basically, uh, one bid, you have to go with their work. Um, the, you know, there was a thought that keeping the bridge open to one southbound lane might have increased the cost. According to the contractor, they didn't feel so because they had to keep it open for the pedestrian and bicycle traffic anyway. So um, they didn't uh, state that there was a big increase because of that. But what about the, I guess I was referring to the undergrounding of the private utilities. Oh, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry that you said okay, that I, might okay. cost more. Yep. Okay. Uh, as part of this budget allocation, we had set aside $410,000 dollars to underground the private utilities, which is MGE uh, for power, charter, and then AT&T. 
uh, we've received a, a proposal back from mg &E, and that cost alone uh, would be $390,000. The AT&T cost is 21000 and we've yet to receive anything from Charter, but we're expecting it to be around the same for um, uh, AT&T, right around 20000 So when we get those agreements and, and put the paperwork in place, they'll be coming through Public Works Committee and City Council uh, for approval. Um, so we're probably going to have to take a look at um, the expenses at that time because we had 410 allocated and we're going to be over that so okay any questions Doug um, what are the bridge enhancements it's going to receive a new deck um, oh, a complete okay. new deck new parapet new railing right okay um, okay I thought you meant something you know in addition to no work okay no the, the structure will remain but basically everything on the structure will be repaired or remodeled okay anyone else okay will the clerk please call the roll alder groupie aye alder moore aye alder spate aye alder wood aye alder kitzler aye motion passes uh item F, consideration of resolution 19-4-2345, approval of proposal from Strand Associates for engineering and construction services for South Winnico Road improvements. Is there a motion to approve this? Move approve. Second. Dan? Thank you. Um, second reading again here tonight for this. The only uh, addition would be the April 3rd <coughs> Public Works Committee recommendation, unless there's uh, questions. Anyone? Hearing none, will the clerk please call the roll? <coughs> Alder Kitzler? Aye. Alder Groupie? Aye. Alder Moore? Aye. Alder Spate? Aye. Alder Wood? Aye. Motion passes. Item G, consideration of resolution 19 4 2347, amending the 2019 capital budget to complete temporary limited easement acquisition services for Atwood Avenue reconstruction, also put forth by the Public Works Committee. Is there a motion to approve this? Move approval. Second. Second. Dan? Okay, thank you. Um, again, second reading here. No, no uh, changes except for the uh, April 3rd Public Works Committee recommendation for approval. Any questions? Hearing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Alder Groupie? Aye. Alder Moore? Aye. Alder Spate? Aye. Alder Wood? Aye. Alder Kitzler? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Final item uh, H, consideration of resolution 19-4-2348, approval of an affidavit <coughs> of correction to the certified survey map number 14728 to rename Metropolitan Lane put forth by the city administrator. Is there a motion to approve this? Move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Brian? Uh, thank you. Just as a follow-up to our first reading at the last council meeting, the Public Works Committee did uh, affirmatively recommend approval of the name change uh, from Metropolitan Lane to Inland Way, which is required under city ordinance. And second, in response to a question from a uh, council member, uh, I did provide email correspondence to the Yacht Club regarding the proposed change, and we'll stay in contact with them once some of the details get finalized about it. Questions? Doug? Um, aside from or in, in, correcting the certified survey map, <coughs> Aren't there other, isn't there something else we need to do, amend the official map or something to change? Uh, the, if the, the ordinance is very unclear in terms of the process. It just references the official map, but it doesn't give any further guidance on what needs to happen. So between looking at state law and our ordinance, uh, we followed the procedure the best we believe we needed to. Okay. Uh, there'll be some follow-up uh, correspondence to left to with the utilities, uh, with the Postal Service and some other entities regarding the name change, but I think... Um, we've dealt with it, what we need to our, on our end, and then we'll also change our official city maps. But I don't think there's a procedural step that we need to take beyond what we've done here tonight. All right, good, thank you. Any other questions? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. All right, uh, we'll move on to new business. Item 2A, consideration of resolution 19-4-2350, accepting a communications needs assessment report put forth by the city administrator. Is there, no, this, do we need to do this in two reads? Or are we no, do this, this in one? Yeah, I think you can do this in one. Is there a motion to approve this? 
move approval. This There's would be a suspension of the rules. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there a motion to suspend the rules? I'll move to suspend the rules and take this item out of order. Second. Is there a motion to approve this resolution? I'll move approval. I'll second. Okay. Uh, Maggie Baum is going to, did you want to say anything? Yeah, just, I mean, first? briefly, you, you know the history of this. Uh, last year, uh, the council uh, authorized the city staff to work uh, with Maggie Baum of Maggie B uh, Communications to kind of do a, an assessment, a needs assessment of the city's communication uh, avenues. And Maggie's put that presentation together mm -hmm. in the final report, which I previously emailed to you. Uh, we've asked Maggie to come before the council tonight to kind of provide a high level recap of her study and answer any questions that the council may have on her study and, and what some next steps might be. Okay. Thank you, Maggie. All right. Thank you for having me. Um, so I think I'll go through, I put together some slides just highlighting kind of the top level findings in the report. Um, as Brian said, you've all gotten that. So I'm sure you've read it word for word. Um, so maybe we'll just go through the slides fairly quickly so that we have a little bit more time for discussion. But that said, feel free to stop me anytime and ask questions as we go as well. Um, so our agenda for, uh, for this part of the meeting tonight, we'll just quickly go through the project scope and desired outcomes that were set forth um, by the communications work group. Um, we'll talk a little, bit, a little bit about the process and approach um, of my work, a summary of the key findings, a summary of recommendations, um, some of the immediate priorities that came out of this work and that were actually um, included as part of phase one um, that I was retained to do. And then what comes next? Um, so the project scope, um, in short, was really just to evaluate the communications functions of the city, both internally, um, so how staff communicates, and then e externally how we communicate to um, residents, non-residents, other key audiences. Um, and the, the goal of that was really to look for opportunities to improve, enhance, streamline, create efficiencies. And then the second piece of it was to develop the foundation for future <coughs> marketing and communications efforts, um, specifically in the form of a streamlined brand, um, so logo and brand guidelines to support the use of that logo. Uh, desired outcomes, and these were f finessed, but primarily taken from the RFP uh, that was put forth um, to increase efficiency and effectiveness of communication with the community, given our current resources, um, as well as tangible qualitative and quantitative information to support requests for additional funds. Um, to <coughs> to gain some immediate strategies and actions that community leadership can take to advance our commitment to inform, educate, engage residents, um, and promote our community assets, and to create uh, a platform to further articulate and develop Monona's brand, voice, and value proposition. Um, the process and approach, fairly straightforward. Um, I was given a ton of background information. Obviously, there's a, a wealth of information that already exists. Um, so there was a pretty significant review of strategic plans and other marketing communications uh, and strategic initiatives that have happened in the past. Um, auditing existing policies and procedures of how city staff in particular communicates. Um, auditing existing marketing and communications materials, so everything from the printed guide to social media channels and things like that. Um, In-depth interviews with all department heads, key committee members, volunteers, other stakeholders, um, as well as targeted outreach to some key residents, so some longtime residents as well as some newer residents. And then um, an analysis of some comparative municipalities to see if we could gain some insight and in, in best practices from what other communities were doing. So um, a summary of key findings, um, and you can find this uh, starting on page eight of the full report. Um, so really, the, the first key finding was that Monona is really a, a tale of two cities, right? We have this nice, small, close-knit community, but we also have a lot of services and amenities of a larger community. We're surrounded by Madison, so we have those, we have that sort of all of Madison is right here um, going on as well. So we sort of have this juxtaposition of um, older residents, younger residents, 
big city, small close-knit community. So really sort of these, this dichotomy of, of what Monona is all about. Um, second, uh, they're really, I uncovered a real lack of process and priority that there really hadn't been um, a foundation for communications. It didn't, didn't really exist in certain position descriptions. It didn't really exist um, as kind of a long-standing or ongoing agenda item in key places. There didn't seem to be a solid foundation for how we communicate. Um, third, our smaller community size did not prevent um, the fact that we really operate in silos and, and how departments uh, see what they're doing primarily within the scope of their own department, which is obviously very natural and normal, but also can hinder the bigger picture in terms of how we um, advance one sort of one voice and one brand for Monona. Uh, fourth, information overload. This exists pretty much <laughs> anywhere and everywhere you look these days. People are getting bombarded with tons of competing messages for their attention and there's only so much time in a day. There are only so many emails they're going to read. Um, there's just a lot of information coming at people from a lot of different channels, um, whether that's print, email, billboards, you name it. There's information coming at people from all different directions and kind of an overload happening. Um, and then finally, while we are similar to some comparable communities, uh, I think there's a feeling, at least from what I uncovered, there's a feeling that we could be quite a bit better. Um, right, that the people who live here and work here recognize Monona as something really special and unique and that we're not necessarily capitalizing on that in how we reach out to our target audiences. Any questions so far before we move on? Anyone? Um, so, so from the, those findings, um, came some five key recommendations for how we might address some of those challenges or opportunities. Um, and these start on page 10 of your full report. <coughs> and they are numbered corresponding to the, to the slide here. Um, so first one, for, for Monona communications efforts to advance, communications really has to be established and supported as a priority from city leadership um, on down and that needs to happen on a proactive and consistent and ongoing basis. Uh, and then you'll see in your document, and I don't know how much detail we wanna go into on these right now, but within each recommendation, um, there's a little bit of further discussion or description, and then there are some bulleted strategies and tactics that could support each recommendation. Um, and then also in each section, there is a list of potential benefits efficiencies to be gained, return on investment for implementing some of these recommendations. So um, I think I won't go into detail on those right now, but we can talk about them as we discuss. Um, so for now, I'll just go through the, the bigger picture recommendations. Uh, second, streamline the city's website and social media presence so it is more proactively and reactively friendly. Uh, one of the biggest pieces of feedback that I got from both uh, people who use the back end of the website, city staff, who's responsible for updating it, um, and end users, is that it's clunky, it's difficult to find things, it's difficult to update, um, there's not a lot of support or training as far as uh, making those updates and making it user friendly. Um, similarly, <laughs> there are some efficiencies I think could be gained on the social media side as well. Some. Um, some good kind of low-hanging fruit return on investment opportunities to make them a little bit more um, streamlined and user-friendly. Um, number three, um, I think it's really important to increase awareness of the things we do already have, so the different channels and functions and systems that are already in place, because there really are a lot of great things already in place. I think the bigger challenge is that people don't necessarily know they exist or they don't know how to take advantage of them or access them. Um, so I think increasing awareness of the functions and capabilities that are already here and the structure that's already in place and focusing on informing and engaging residents about those things is, is really important. Um, that will help get people the information they want when they want it um, and in the manner they wish that they would prefer to receive it. Could you just give an example of, of that? Well, the notify me text alerts would be one example. Um, 
at, at last count, I, Leah, I'm not sure if you remember off the top of your head, but um, there was a significant number of people signed up for those notify me alerts, but right. in the scope of the number of residents, it was kind of a drop in the bucket. Right. There was a lot of room to get more people signed up for those alerts. Okay. That would be just one example. Yeah. It did grow a lot during the flooding. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. Well, like we have almost a silver thousand, lining, don't we? right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, let's uh, we could look for some ways that don't uh, right. hinge on a <laughs> disaster. <laughs> yeah. um, number four, invest in establishing uh, daily communications processes. Um, so that would be more things that um, kind of happen in and around the offices and, and among staff. Um, you know, one thing I heard a lot of in my research is um, that people just say, well, that's the way we've always done it. Or they say, my <laughs> personal favorite, I just send it to Leah. <laughs> and there's not necessarily a reason or a process in place for people to know what they should be doing with something. Um, so they sort of tend to do things the way they've always done it. And that's not necessarily the most efficient or effective. Um, and then finally, keep an eye on the big picture and future vision for Monona. So, you know, there, there's a lot of passion among staff and there are a lot of exciting things happening here um, right now and, and plan for the future. So I think it's really important to establish a solid foundation for outreach and communication now so that you can leverage that moving forward. Um, so we can talk more in, in detail about all those things. I just want to quickly go through a couple other um, immediate priorities that came out of phase one of this process, and, and that was to refine the logo and establish some usage guidelines for the logo and for different pieces of the identity package, colors, fonts, <coughs> et cetera. Um, the website <coughs> upgrade that is available uh, via Civic Plus is also another real opportunity happening right now. Um, you know, something as a client of Civic, Civic Plus that is available to you, it's not an additional cost. Obviously, it's an investment of time um, to figure out what that upgrade looks like and, and how it will change the website, but certainly that's an immediate priority as well. Um, and I just want to quickly show a few of, and I don't know if all of you have had a chance to see the new, um, the brand guidelines document that came out or the logo. It's, there, there's nothing significantly changed about this, but what this process did was take the existing logo and streamline it just a little bit. Um, the, the main difference being this logo is just a little bit more square. Um, so the previous version was uh, much more vertically oriented, which doesn't always translate well on things like letterhead or um, websites, social media pages, things like that. Um, so this gives a little bit more of a square version or less totally vertical. And we also created um, corresponding horizontal versions for each variation of the logo. And I'll just buzz through a couple quickly here. So we've got the city of Monona version and then just Monona. Um, with the thinking that city of Monona logos would be used primarily for things that are city business, whereas having a Monona, plain Monona logo is a little bit more suited toward um, tourism and, and that type of outreach. And then using community media as an example, each variation of the logo then has an application with the city department added to it for all the city departments. So um, you'll see these are the um, Monona only variations and then city of Monona. Um, so the, the thinking is that there's a logo available for pretty much whatever purpose. And you know you see that there's color, there's grayscale. Um, so that when somebody does need a logo to put on something that um, there is the right logo available for them and instructions on how that should be used. I won't say which department head said when he needs a logo for something, he just takes one and tweaks it to uh, match whatever need he has coming up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there is, if I can open this link, I will just real quickly um, show the brand guidelines document. Not sure if it's gonna go, this computer's a little bit slow. Box updates. Yeah, maybe we don't want to do this now. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Um, the brand guidelines document is 64 pages of all the different logos, um, all organized by department name, um, with corresponding file names that link to your electronic shared directory so that anyone who's looking for a logo can easily see the corresponding file name, get right to it, um, and have an appropriate logo right at their fingertips. It also includes um, all the color guidelines, font guidelines, and things like that. Um, so that, again, ideally that everyone's using a consistent look and feel for all the materials that are being created. Um, the brand guidelines also set forth some um, criteria about any production pieces. So if you want to order t-shirts, um, that there is a sign-off required by Brian if you're going to basically submit an order for any kind of produced, branded um, swag or, or gear. Oh, Let's see if we can. Questions? Anyone? Okay, I think we're not going to deal with the going to the electronic file of this. Molly, did you have something? Yeah, I, first of all, thank you so much for all of your work. I know that this has been a very important project and what, excuse me, one that the council has been pushing for for quite a while. Um, I think I just want to point out that in the, the larger official document that we received about your findings that it mentions again the necessity of having more of a full-time IT person to take on some of these um, jobs that others in various city departments tend to do that's not part of their job description, mm -hmm. um, especially if we're talking about streamlining many different modes of communication and social media into sort of one platform or just to incorporate multiple platforms into one. Um, so I think, you know, we've talked about it before, but I think we'll need to have that conversation mm -hmm. again as we learn more from this. So. We yeah, did and increase hours for the IT person yes, in this but year's it budget. it sounds like, also. you know, given all of this and what we continue, you know, we don't even know yet with the website rollout what it's right. going to look like and just something to keep on the back burner for the future. Yeah, and I, that absolutely, I mean, I think there's a need for additional support and whether that comes in the form of IT, I mean, I think certainly on the website and having someone available who can help troubleshoot issues that people run into on a daily basis. If they're updating a web page and for some reason the, the font color is in red and they can't change it <laughs> to something that's not red. Um, I think IT support's really important in that regard. Um, however, it doesn't address issues such as creating content for social media and things like that. So. Um, you know, I think there are several different ways that that additional um, staff time could come into play, whether that's, um, you know, lifting some responsibilities off somebody's plate who has an interest in doing more communications-oriented work, or hiring a part-time person, or trying to utilize interns for certain things. Um, I think there are a lot of different ways that could look. Thank you. Were you done with your presentation? Um, the only or did thing... You yeah, no, actually that's it, yep. That's it, okay. So the, the okay I'm next. sorry, I just wanted to make sure we were. <laughs> and then you also had the uh, the other document, the um, key message. <clears throat> yep. I don't know if you wanted to talk about that at um, all. Yeah, we can talk a little bit about that too. Um, so the intention with the key message document is not to serve as a be all and end all guide to anything and everything that ever can or should be written about Monona. Um, but just to serve as a resource so when people are pulling together things like grant applications or um, a press release or whatever it may be that there is a consistent set of language that is available people can pull from so they're not sitting down with a blank piece of paper every time. I think it would be really useful for a lot of things. Nancy? Yeah, I just <clears throat> wanted to, to say thank you and I just wanted to remind people that we started this project a long time ago, and in fact, this report was finished in July of 2018. So, um, so I would say that <coughs> even some of it is a little dated. In that, at the time that we were going through this, um, we had a different city administrator, and I know Brian, you've been you've already upped our game, so to speak, as it relates to some social media and so and, uh, and some other things. So, uh, I'm grateful for that. Um, and, and grateful for uh, Maggie uh, being so patient. The other thing I would say is uh, I can't stress how important, particularly give, uh, with the branding guidelines and the logo, how important it's going to be for, uh, for 
um, everyone on staff to get rid of old files. It's, I, I, I have had, honest to God, two calls just in the last week of my own clients who were grabbing draft versions of things that I worked with them on and, um, and I had board members contacting me saying, I know we redid this, but it doesn't say anything about this, this, and this. And I was like, well, that's because you're, you know, you're, you're three drafts back instead of in the final version. And it's just a matter of people not getting rid of that old stuff. Yeah. So um, I just think it's really important now that we do have the new logo and we have so many versions of it, there's no need to hang on to the old versions and to, to shut ourselves of some, <coughs> mm -hmm. some files. Um, yeah, and on that same note, one thing yeah. we did talk about <coughs> in sort of the, in the communications work group um, over this process was some staff training to support the rollout of these resources being available as well. And I don't think it has to be anything elaborate, but you know, making sure that people do have the information they need and the tools and they know where to find things um, and are given some instruction about the how, where, when, why. Right. And, and I would just say too that, that um, you know, there are some obviously some items in here um, uh, besides the website um, uh, and, uh, and Molly mentioning the IT support. The IT support piece um, is really about, you know, whether or not we're getting the biggest bang for our buck with the IT that we've got. Not because we did extend the number of hours for the IT support that we have um, since the support was written, um, but um, but it, we're paying a premium for super duper IT support when um, uh, you know when people are uh, potentially struggling with not super duper high tech problems a lot of the time. So the, the notion being looking at that, and we I think w uh, there's obviously still some things in here that we need to look at and work on um, as as we move forward. Um, and uh, and I would say even this last election uh, was a wake up call to me certainly that the likelihood of misinformation and we and not to mention other things that we've gone through recently the likelihood of misinformation be getting out there and um, a, and uh, or, or inaccurate information um, getting out there and us not being in a position to respond or respond as quickly as we might um, because we don't have very uh, sort of ubiquitous communication support I think it um, presents a challenge for us so Andrew. Thank you very much for doing this. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Um, kind of to piggyback off Nancy's uh, comments that I think since this was completed in July that it's only mm -hmm. exacerbated the need for it, whether it's the emergency or misinformation being thrown around. Um, and then also just generally people not being able to find the information for mm -hmm. one reason or another. Um, so I, I kind of have a few questions, sure. comments, and mm -hmm. feel free to answer what you're able. Um, so in this, I saw you talk to me, uh, at least Christy from Mesba, mm -hmm. maybe some other Mesba representatives. Is did the conversation around including businesses in communications of city operations, city policies, et cetera, come up? And if so. I noticed it wasn't really necessarily addressed as far as how we communicate mm -hmm. to businesses and how they communicate to us. Right. Yeah, not, not <coughs> in particular, but I think that is certainly, um, I don't want to say implied, but I think that communication with businesses and that communication with the school district, um, where you have these other entities and groups out there, that there is room for improvement. Um, and in particular, with MESBA, my sense was that, and I know some of this is actually being addressed already too um, with their advocacy group, but um, they're doing certain things um, that I think we could do better collaboratively. You know, so there are things happening, I think, both on the city side and on the MESBA side where there are opportunities for more collaboration mm -hmm. and um, not having everybody just out there doing their own thing all the time. Um, so I, th I do, I mean, I think there is, is a lot of opportunity to, to do that in general with businesses. And yeah. I think, you know, establishing better processes and, and channels of communication only helps that. Yeah. But, you know, the, but communication specifically to the business community wasn't 
really set as a priority at the yeah. beginning of this process. Um, but I don't think that lessens its importance, mm -hmm. generally speaking. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I'd be, as this kind <coughs> of, excuse me, sorry. As this kind of plays out, it'd be interesting of, I mean, I feel like with Mesba, we have a good partnership. They mm -hmm. should be able to know what we're up to. We're very free flowing, but it seems like, especially after the election, there was some disconnect and discord, if you will, mm -hmm. about us not communicating. So yeah, I, I think, think that's a, a lot of opportunity for stuff <clears throat> to just get lost. And I yeah. think, you know, the same is true with the school district. You have a great relationship there. And I think a lot of stuff works really well, but um, you know, <laughs> there are only so many hours in a day, right? Yeah. And things just, tend to fall through the cracks. Um, now I know that you know the district has a dedicated communication staff person now, which is great. Um, you know mm -hmm. that should only help on all those fronts with their collaborative relationships as well. So um, I think that's a, a positive for sure. Yeah, um, I liked your comment about kind of redoing our city guide. I think there's a lot of information there. I, I like your idea of connecting it more so with links because we can always change the links with different details and different things like that. Um, one thing, just not a question, just more of a comment. Um, I'm wondering if almost in there we could put some city council updates or here's what's kind of on the agenda for the next six months. Obviously things change, but you know, like we've been working with you and communications for about a year. That could have been kind of a highlight <laughs> that we've yeah. talked about. Um, so anyways, that was just an idea that kind of jumped out. Um, Can I add a comment, Alder Kitzler? Sure. So we also have received uh, constituent concerns about you know wanting to see more items in further in advance from meetings and I think that addresses that point as well that we've heard from the community about wanting that specifically so yeah. could you clarify that a little bit more so we got an email from um, a resident who was um, wanting to see agendas for different community and uh, committee um. meetings further in advance and I wasn't sure what the logistics of that were but I think to have you know something where we're just projecting a little bit further out so if people have interest and can plan ahead to attend if they have a desire it would be a useful thing to pursue mm -hmm. if we could and one reason I bring it up too is I mean that's a hard copy compared to I know we put it out on the website and <coughs> right. usually on mm -hmm. Facebook or Twitter or different things like that um, <coughs> one thing uh, and I, I feel like sometimes governments higher ed can kind of bog down in bureaucracy so in one of my previous jobs they started a social media and the government level and there was a whole freedom of information <coughs> kind of task for us. And so what they had to do is screenshots of all of their responses to social media so that if anybody were to mm -hmm. ask for it, I don't know if you had any interaction with that or any thoughts on that or had any just general knowledge. Um, I wouldn't want to comment without knowing what the actual regulations are in this. Okay. In, you know, they, there might be things I don't know about Dane County, state of Wisconsin, whatever it may be that I'm I'm not totally sure how to answer that, but it's you know it's certainly something that needs to be considered with mm -hmm. um, with anything and everything as far as, as outreach and communication goes. Um, you know, I will say one thing that I think the city has done a really good job of is there are all those kinds of policies that you need to comply with, and I think the city's done a good job in that regard. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't always translate well into people who want the information getting it, you know, finding it where they think they should find it or having it delivered to them in a way that they'd like to have it delivered. Yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, I just lost my place here. Da, da, da. I think the next comment I was just gonna make is, uh, you know, what something that kind of stood out to me was, uh, you said um, there was almost zero statements that expressed how to work, how the work of one department could have a halo or horn effect on spreading a positive or negative ripple effect on the city of Monona as a whole. Mm -hmm. And I put yikes next to that because, <laughs> you know, I mean, you mentioned kind of we are small, but we're still in mm -hmm. silos. And that, you know, uh, while I understood that, uh, mm -hmm. that kind of made it jump out to me and really concerns me that, you know, city staff still think yeah. of them as their own little, you know, compartment mm -hmm. and not as a whole city. And we're, we are small enough that I think people need to realize that because whether you're in public works or elsewhere, your reflection mm -hmm. on the city. Yeah, I, I agree. And I want to be clear that none of, none of the comments that led me to that observation were in any way personal attacks or mean-spirited. It's just I think a lot of times people have their heads down because they're so focused on you know, the, the task list, what needs to get done today, this week, this month. Mm -hmm. um, 
so I, you know, I don't think there's any ill intention behind it. It's just I think people are so focused on what they have in front of them. Yeah. Um, and I think that's another opportunity where some, some staff training or some establishing mm -hmm. communications as a priority and doing that in, in a couple <coughs> of different ways can be that frequent reminder to people that, hey, we're all in this together and what happens over here can have a really positive or negative mm -hmm. effect on the city as a whole yeah. or other departments. And to me that really highlighted the you know the importance for whether it's a staff person for communications or just leadership in this general area mm -hmm. uh, you know to move forward as a solid you know unified unit mm -hmm. um, but thank you a lot so much for this anyone else Jim? well thank you Maggie I, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, point out that particularly given that uh, Mayor Miller is diligently watching <laughs> <laughs> um, the sustainability committee had created a little logo with with a few leaves on it and the thing that I really like about that is that it's got green leaves on it mm -hmm. and tonight we passed a resolution talking about the fact that we're a tree city and we're passionate about sustainability in this town when we did our um, strategic plan we said we would have sustainability uh, in everything that the city does, you know, which was a really strong statement for us to make. Now, I realize that uh, change is difficult and we probably don't want to go through another, you know, greener, bluer, better uh, <laughs> debate, but it does strike me that the seagull, I've never heard anyone advocate for the seagull. I remember when Mayor Call used to say that a seagull is a rat with wings, and I, I feel the same way. Um, it does, I mean, traditionally that has been our logo, but we are fundamentally a city that is very proud of our environmental stewardship, um, which is reflected by our commitment mm -hmm. to sustainability. So I just wanted to throw it out there. You know, if the, if the seagull went away and a few leaves were thrown on top, we would have a greener, bluer, Logo. <laughs> I mean, a, a, he's been saving that one. A blue leaf, are you saying? Or, or a green, a green leaf. But you've got the leaf over leaf. the water. You have a problem with phosphorus in the water, so we can't put the leaf in the water. Right. We're yeah. See, I water. knew there was There's something. There's a reason. All right. right. All right. Well, no, but seriously, <laughs> I, I want to address that point because that is something that, when I came on board to start this process, that is something that was talked about and. There at that time was not a strong desire nor the resources to undertake an entire rebrand, mm -hmm. um, because I think it, it, I think Nancy would agree with this in her line of work. But um, that requires a much more long-term, in-depth process that is informed by um, a much more significant research process potentially than what we did here. Um, one that's more specifically geared toward the de development of a new logo and brand identity. Um, so I, do I absolutely love this logo and think it's the perfect representation of all things Monona? Um, I, I can't say that there's not room for improvement at some point in the future, but I think for what was, re was asked of this process and to get something into a workable format so that it could be used and consistent and represent the city well, even if it is, what is a rat with wings? Is that what you said? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think, you know, I, I mean, I think it's, um, to me, it's much more important to have a consistent look and then and use it consistently. Um, you could spend thousands and thousands of dollars and countless hours and months and years, and I think it'd be really hard to find something that's going to make that's you know everyone's going to say that's it that's that's the one thing yes well that's a lesson we've already learned mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so mm -hmm. i just want it's you know this is a, i love the consistency of the rebranding if you will you know i mean i know this isn't a new brand but i do think it's important that we're consistent as a city uh, so i have no argument mm -hmm. with that i just wanted to ask the question yeah. i think one thing we did learn as part of this process was that different departments had taken that and kind of expanded on it in their own way. So there were a lot of different varieties of logo floating around out there that 
I, for one, wasn't aware of. So at least this is a consistent. Yeah. Um, One thing I will mention that I think is, and and the brand guidelines are where they are right now. That doesn't mean they can't be updated and enhanced. Mm -hmm. One thing that we asked and didn't really get any, um, a lot of feedback on, um, was we had put out an ask for anyone who wanted to incorporate a different um, component of a logo. For example, uh, a badge for police or fire. Um, And we didn't get a lot of feedback on that front. Um, So I will say I think there is room if we want to update the current brand guidelines to make an exception for adding that badge on police and fire materials or um, having sustainability have a a little bit of a bit of wiggle room to use what they have developed. Um, I'm not totally opposed to that as long as it's you know, it's something that's done strategically and thoughtfully and applied consistently. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, to follow up on Chad's comment, um, uh, green leaves aside, uh, <clears throat> um, going back to Bob's, actually, that we did have a conversation uh, uh, with Maggie um, and Leah. We all had a conversation about whether or not this um, refreshed logo should or might include a tagline. Um, and um, there are some of us that feel rather strongly that it should only because um, some of this effort, um, I, frankly, I, th- I think, uh, was about being able to distinguish Monona from Madison. And I don't know that that logo in and by itself, um, uh, you know, that um, immediately think, oh, a totally different place you know um so so i think that the tagline can be helpful in that regard but we were told that whatever the three what greener bluer what was it uh mayor smarter Smarter. um hmm? brighter brighter Brighter. greener bluer brighter yeah was that what it was yeah Yeah. (laughs) um we we heard rumor that uh when we attempted uh, creating a tagline before that it, it kind of crumbled into greener, bluer, greener bluer brighter greener bluer brighter it uh, was pretty contentious wasn't it? I was not on the council it was then. very contentious oh I was on the I was a <laughs> witness to it I know yes. it's like okay can we be contentious over some really important things now um <laughs> sorry uh so anyway, I, I you know I think that that's still an option too, and certainly I think some of the language uh, that Maggie's provided will be helpful. But I uh, and, and I think we definitely um, can work on that in terms of being able to position ourselves as distinct from. I mean, I know everybody here goes through the exact same thing that I do, which is I say I'm from Monona, and people look at me like I'm, um, you know inquisitively like where's that and I say it's a small city surrounded by Madison and they go oh okay you know um, so but I honestly I hate constantly having to describe Monona as in relation to only in relation to you know what it's surrounded by you know I mean it's just uh, so and I think we're way better than that yeah. And else? I think there's definitely, uh, you know, the, the one of the desired outcomes of this project was to set a foundation, right? So yep. um, that's not to say the work is done, but that hopefully there's a, a foundation to build from. I think there's certainly lots we can work on here. Anyone else have anything? Jen, did you want to say anything? No. Oh. Okay, um, we did have a motion to accept this. Yep. So... If no one else has any questions, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much, Maggie. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Uh, Next up is item new business, item 2B, consideration of resolution. 19-4-2349, adopting a policy to provide a paid parental leave benefit for city employees put forth by the Finance and Personnel Committee. And this is, Leah will give a little overview of the policy. Thank you, Mayor O'Connor. This is the first draft of a policy that 
is the result of an initiative in the 2019 budget to provide two weeks of paid family um, leave to new parents, so to employees who are parents of a newborn or a newly adopted child. Um, the council in the 2019 budget passed two weeks for this purpose as well as another two weeks for um, employees to take paid leave time to take care of sick family members. So this draft policy is the first of those initiatives, so the paid parental leave policy. Um, you have it in your packet. I'm just going to sort of highlight, I guess, the highlights of it, and then um, you can ask, ask your questions away. So, um, The purpose of the policy is to care for and bond with a new child. So the policy, um, as it stands written right now, does not include um, employees who are acting as surrogates or sperm donors, and it does not include temporary welfare placements like foster care or guardianship. The policy is um, two weeks of paid leave, paid at a 100% salary for permanent employees. So that's all full-time employees and permanent part-time employees. Doesn't include um, hourly part-time employees, seasonal employees, or paid on-call employees. For union employees, um, we do have two unions in the city, public safety unions, one fire and one police union. This um, policy would be a subject that is a mandatory bargaining subject because it relates to wages and um, hours of work. So if it's the council's desire to have this um, policy available to all employees, non-represented and represented employees, we would have to present it as a um, memorandum of understanding on our two current labor contracts, um, which are both, uh, we're in our first year of two year contracts with both those unions. So we would present it as an MOU, and then um, that would be expired at the end of the contract. And then those unions could decide to keep those MOUs going, or they could decide to bargain the terms of the MOUs at the end of the contract. Um, currently, employees who, who want to take leave for the birth of a child or the adoption of a child can do so through the FMLA. And, um, this policy would not be in addition to the FMLA, but it would run in concurrent with the FMLA. So um, it would basically allow employees two weeks of their FMLA leave to be paid at 100% of their salary without having to use any of their accumulated vacation or sick time. The policy currently requires that employees take the leave all at once, so all two weeks at once, or um, in two blocks of one week each. We decided not to have the policy allow them to take it intermittently for a period of time or to reduce their work schedule for an extended amount of time. The leave um, would not be able to be taken until after the birth or adoption occurred, and then it would need to be used within six months after the birth or adoption. And it would need to be um, used only once in every 12 month period. So it can only be used once a year, basically. Um, that's sort of the highlights of the policy. Questions? Um, Rupi, then Aldermore. I guess I would like information about how to present the, the, what the process of the MOU would look like, if we could discuss that in the future at some point. Just mm -hmm. I think talking about that would be important. Um, but I guess something that I felt relatively uncomfortable about within the policy wording itself was that people who act as a surrogate are not able to be eligible for this benefit. And I guess I don't know if the language is pulled from existing policies or, you know, presumably you looked at a variety of different existing policies, <coughs> but I would assume that there needs to be some amount of time for that person, irrespective of whether or not they're going to keep their child. Um, so I would like to have um, a discussion about re-examining that line specifically and just maybe making some accommodations, whether it be two weeks or not, for somebody who carries a child for nine months and then has no access to this. Well, I can address that in, I guess, why that decision was made to disclude surrogates. Um, and the decision was made because it was felt like the purpose of this particular policy was for new parents to bond with a new child or a newly adopted mm -hmm. child. Um, and that someone who, act, who was acting as a surrogate would still be able to take leave through family medical leave because pregnancy is considered a qualifying event for, for purposes of family medical leave. They'd have to use their own leave time if they wanted 
wanted it to be paid. But that's the reason that I guess surrogacy was not included in this particular policy was really because of the, you know, the definition of what this policy was trying to do, which was to, you know, have new parents bond with children. Right. I, I guess it makes an assumption though about what that role of that, you mm -hmm. know, what role that person is playing mm -hmm. in their surrogacy. So, um, you know, I think that's something that's worth a little bit more in depth discussion. I think. Alder Moore. Yeah, I was, I, just to follow up on what Motley said, I was going to ask uh, as it related to foster and why it wouldn't apply to foster for the same reason, and I'm going to go back to something embedded in her initial comment, which is, you know, uh, where did this come from? I mean, I'm assuming you guys didn't invent the wheel here. Right. Was it um, Sun Prairie we based it? Several different communities. No, Sun Prairie, on. we based it off of Dane County for mm -hmm. all intents and purposes. Sun Prairie based theirs off of them. Um, a lot of those actually specifically listed exclusions for surrogacy. Um, foster was excluded um, because, again, you're looking at bonding with children. There's fosters where, uh, you know, they're, it, it's temporary housing usually. Um, so it was really just looking at everything else and then with kind of the premise of this policy is really to allow new parents to bond with their children. So this is not, you know, a new wheel. This is, uh, you know, probably 90% of the other policies that we've seen out there. And, and with the exception of the definitions, obviously, uh, um, because you're, you're, you're winnowing it down to a specific event, um, is there some reason why there has to be two policies? I mean, it seems to me if I need family leave because I'm the other one is much, much more complicated, the other type of leave, than this. It is. Yeah. In fact, we haven't even been able to find an example, have we, from a, gov a municipality or government that I know You're of? You're talking parental care? Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, the, the, the examples of that are few and far between, so we're trying to okay. research different options for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? Doug? Um, <clears throat> so I made a number of sort of minor comments at, at finance. The one I would talk about just briefly and the definitions <coughs> where it states that in the second sentence the, the parent also means the partner of the birth parent or adoptive parent. I had suggested that we uh, define the term partner um, uh, in terms of using the same kind of language and principles that we've done in the past for domestic partners. Um, which d I did think of one question, under FMLA, are domestic partners eligible? Um, I believe they're eligible under the federal law, but not the state law. Then they, it may, the definition may very well be then in the FMLA, so we could either refer to that or, or mm -hmm. just borrow the language, but I think it'd be probably be a good idea to call it out and define it. Um, I can mm -hmm. tell you that the Dane County policy I looked at um, during the break, it actually um, requires that um, the employee be named as a parent on the child's birth certificate or adoption certificate. So it doesn't apply to domestic partners? It though. does not. Well, you could be a domestic partner and still be listed as a parent, couldn't you? Well, that's true. Right, you could be the parent, yeah. Um, so that's another way we could go with that. But we're, we're saying parent also means the partner. I mean, if you're a, Correct. a birth parent then or adoptive parent and you're not, in a, you know, you're not married, it's still qualified, but this is saying I guess if one partner you know, has a child with someone else, but you're the domestic partner, I guess is correct. Anyway, I, I just think for clarity's sake, so that people have expectate under you know, that they know what's covered and what's not, that we define it. <coughs> Anyone else? Is that clear? Molly or Alder Groupie is looking like what am I? Yeah, I just think I don't know. 
there are just so many situations and I don't know how often you know these arise but I think that's a valid point to bring up and I just think I don't know I think we should be very forward-thinking and modern in how we define these relationships um, I think it's a good opportunity to, to kind of grow with as our city grows with younger and younger and different looking families so mm -hmm. Jill? so uh, to that end um, I'm just curious I mean, do we really need the male or female here? I mean, that's a very yeah. binary. We were going to drop that. Yeah. We were going to drop that yeah. after. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We did okay. discuss yep. that in finance. Great. Anything else? Andrew. So I'd say uh, for those that make comments, if you have specific wording, please send that our way or Leah's way, and then we can work together to recraft this. Because again, I mean, we've put. Leah's put in numerous hours, so for certainly, you know, thank you for doing this. I mean, we've been working since on this since January. Um, but also, I mean, I keep in mind that this is a start. This is not the finish line. This is not my end goal for this policy. Two weeks, I think, is, you know, nothing compared to what other municipalities are putting forward. So to me, this is just a start and seeing where it goes. Um, so I hope people don't, you know, think about this as, you know, once we pass it, it's something we're going to move on from, but hopefully it's something we analyze each year or regularly, and again, hopefully we can add on to. So, uh, you know, I agree we should be forward thinking and not just copy and paste what everybody else has done. I think we've done a good job of copying and pasting some things, but also looking at it with a Monona perspective of you know, what needs to be tweaked or adding definitions when other municipalities don't have definitions for them. Um, and I think, you know, again, I'll applaud Leah. She's thought of a lot of different scenarios that could pop up uh, that she's either experienced or has heard about that we've tried to address in here as well. So, you know, certainly thanks for the ideas, but also, you know, if you do have ideas, please pass them along too, uh, because I know Leah's all, all ears for those. Mm -hmm. And just send it to Leah. Yeah. Yield. Yeah. Yield standby. Send it to Leah. Yeah. And, and I agree with Andy. When I agreed to put this in the budget, it was the, with the idea of we'll start with this and see how it goes. And so that that's what we're doing. Yeah. Anyone else? I just want to point out that that all oh, we just pointed out that we just did the same thing that we just discussed during the communications needs assessments, which is. When all else fails, just send it to Leah. That was just a joke. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Leah yeah, is a little too long. But yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? So can I just ask for clarification? So we are sort of proceeding on the second read with this policy kind of with the intent that it currently was written, or are we looking to draft an alternative that is more encompassing? I guess regarding the surrogacy mm -hmm. issue, yeah, I kind of question that. So I guess if, if there's no likelihood that that is going to change, if that's a po if it's not a possibility, um, but if there would be a way to make some provision or change the wording or, um, but I don't, you know, again, you've been working on it for a really long time, but to me that was just something that stood out as something that I don't think we should exclude those people from having some sort of access that, to this policy. So I'd be, you know, if, if it's likely that, you know, we will not amend it, you know, using any different wording, then I will back off. But if there's a possibility, I'd be happy to do some work on that and send it to you. So if. I mean, I, for one, I'd be interested in the examples that you'd have in that, because the way I think of surrogacy, I would exclude them. Um, so I'm interested in learning more about it. Um, and then I would also, you know, just generally, whether it's this policy or other ones, propose an amendment. We have the discussion. Mm -hmm. It can be voted up or down. Um, you know, you can have your, you know, share your piece at that time. Okay. So I, I wouldn't, I don't want to inhibit you by thinking, well, because of the discussion today, we're going to not consider it. I think Brian had something to yeah. <clears throat> Point of clarification and question for Leah. In the FMLA or the Wisconsin FMLA or MLA policies, did they have a, a category, f kind of a catch-all uh, phrase where it says the hiring authority has the discretion to allow a category of leave that's not been previously defined, which would get at the surrogacy question or if there's some other 
you know, scenario that we hadn't envisioned a definition for or a situation for that would give, you know, the person sitting in this chair the opportunity to sign off on use of two weeks paid leave, even though it didn't fit into one of cleanly into one of the couple of categories that we've laid out in the policy. In this policy or in the FMLA? In, in the FMLA or Wisconsin FMLA or any of the other examples we've looked at. It, I don't want it to get us too far away from what kind of the the, the guidance from the federal and the state is, is saying, but I'm, I'm wondering if there's a way to put a, you know, fourth or fifth category that says, you know, you know, other situations not defined above can be approved upon the discretion of the hiring authority or city administrator, however we want to phrase that, mm -hmm. that would get to all their groupies' uh, concerns about not defining every scenario that might come our way five, ten years down the road. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think in terms of... Um, any type of surrogacy <coughs> situation is is going to be covered under the FMLA because it's a um, a pregnancy which is considered a qualifying medical condition under the FMLA. So women who choose to act as surrogates are always going to have leave available to them under the FMLA. Um, whether it's available under this policy or not is a decision of this board. So um, I think the FMLA encompasses far more than our policy encompasses. And so that would leave us discretion um, in terms of approving leave under those bases. I'm talking about the paid leave mm -hmm. um, more specifically. Maybe that's something we can check with Dane County and mm -hmm. see if they've got. And we fall under the Wisconsin FMLA, not the federal. Is we fall under both. both. Under we both. Have, yeah. But where, what about if they diverge, like this domestic partner? Does the federal cover that, but Wisconsin doesn't? I know Wisconsin has passed some laws saying that, for instance, domestic partners can't be covered under each other's health and insurance policies. Correct. So where the policies are the same, they run concurrently, and where they're different, you just run with one policy. So. And can we um, choose which policy we run with? Or? Um, well, both policies apply to us, so we just have to apply the policy that fits the circumstance, if that makes sense. Uh, well, for instance, what about the domestic partner insurance them? Because we no longer cover. We cannot. We are required by law not to cover domestic. But that isn't necessarily re related to FMLA. That's, That's not a related. separate law that Correct. Wisconsin passed. Okay. Correct. Okay. Nancy. Yeah, I would just say um, to uh, again bring up my. I, I think the notion of foster uh, foster kids being a short term thing is a misnomer. Uh, and I'm happy to research it. And if I, you know, um, my experience, at the few foster families that I know, it's actually as intense and about as long as adopting a kid. <laughs> um, so, uh, so the notion of ki the bonding notion that we're trying to get at here, uh, it seems to me it might apply. But I, uh, but I, I, I'm gonna go ahead and research it. And if I come up with something, I'll be sure to do exactly what you asked Andrew and Leah, which is come back with some language or amendment. Yeah. Nancy? Or, I'm well, sorry. Question for Nancy, yeah. yes. Um, foster parents do get paid some amount, correct? Mm -hmm. oh. mm -hmm. Okay. Because that's really what this policy is not about whether people should get to take time off when they have a child or it's whether we're going to pay provide two weeks of paid leave because mm -hmm. so in addition mm -hmm. to the leave they already get it's paid in addition women to anyway. vacation or yeah. sick leave or yeah. whatever yeah is foster care covered by FMLA I, I don't know if it is or not um, I believe it is but I have to double check anyone else thank you for your work on mm -hmm. this Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, our final item, resolution number 19 4 2351, approving an agreement with Monona Bank for facility naming rights for an outdoor ice rink, ice rink at the riverfront development um, put forth by the Parks and Recreation Director. Um, before we start this discussion, I just want to say that. Um, I've been concerned about the growing cost of this park for months, if not years, um, and have strongly urged Jake um, 
and our previous uh, administrator to look for sponsorship opportunities. And Jake came to me several months ago, um, asked, telling me that he, he was would like to um, approach one on the bank about naming rights for the ice rink and asked if it was okay if he um, started negotiations with them. And, um, and I told him to go ahead. And um, that's kind of how we've come to, to this today. So Jake, you wanna? Yes, I may need some technical help from the fellows in the back. So this is plugged in right here. Oh, we're done. Yeah. You guys got it. All right, thank you, Mayor and members of the council. Um, pleased to be here tonight to um, note that we do have uh, an agreement with Monona Bank on naming rights of an ice rink at the Riverfront Park. Uh, it's just going back through our timeline and it seems like it's been a long time, but it's not really been that long at all that we've talked about the formation of this park, um, what it would include, and how we would get there to pay for it. Um, this conceptual design was a final design that the council approved um, before the capital budget of 2018. So during the period of 2018, um, starting in January, working with our consultant Vandewal um, and Strand and Associates, the idea of creating kind of a winter wonderland at this park, uh, an all season park was kind of paramount in, in our main design, how we looked at this public space and how it be used. Uh, during the summer months of June uh, was, was some of the first informal discussions I had when talking about uh, potential naming rights with uh, Minota Bank and a partnership that would go through for this new project. Um, with not having anything approved, there was no specifics at that time. In October of 2018 is when our capital budget was approved. And that did have a line item for a refrigerated ice skating rink in the capital budget with revenues um, in the form of a naming rights as quoted other revenues. So there was money budgeted for the ice rink with other revenues. At that point, I, uh, with the blessing of Mayor O'Connor, I met with Minona Bank to start to look at what a parameters would look like, um, expressing our interest to be in partnership with them given the geography of one of their branches, the long-standing history they've had in this community, um, and, and also I think the, the benefits that we could provide to them at this particular park with the exposure. Um, back and forth, looking at um, those parameters in January uh, were kind of were the final um, details of what we would be looking at as far as um, an agreement with benefits, uh, dollar amount terms. At that point, our, in February, Attorney Cole was drafting um, the legal proposal to go to Monona Bank. Um, and we had just heard back on a few things in the last week or so. Um, so this is, uh, I think, as we go through a few things in the PowerPoint here. This was some conceptual renderings we had uh, made up of what the park would look like with some of the Minona Bank uh, logo. Uh, so as you can see, um, in this rendering, we have uh, at least preliminary name below deck for the name of the concession stand, at least indicated in this rendering. We have the ice rink, um, a logo etched in the uh, ice of Minona Bank. Um, banners on the flag poles that are indicated in the agreement and decals on the boards which would be a clear plexiglass type of board uh, in in a few spots around the ice rink itself uh, here's a little more close-up of what the rink would look like from uh, looks like be about the deck of the coffee shop and the noodle shop looking down on the rink uh, with our fire pit there. 
and uh, skating rink and the walking loop going around the rink. And then this is a view of the rink, looking at it from the river uh, with the activity deck. So you get a little bit of scope of kind of what this park's gonna look like in the winter time um, and with some of the um, branding of Monona Bank. In, in our discussions with Monona Bank, it was um, not to like blast of the bank all over the park, <coughs> but to match the classiness, I think, of what the overall project and development would look like. Um, and I, be I believe you've seen the interior conceptual of what the build out of the concession stand would look like. So right now, our park project is underway. Uh, the concession project is underway. Um, we're in construction phase right now. Uh, we're getting fairly close to that period of where if we want to have a refrigerated ice rink for this next season, uh, we're gonna have to be issuing an RFP for um, the installation and supply of it to get here by mid-October. We're also within that window of a five or six month period that we like to see for um, the recruitment and training of staff for a housing and ice skating rink. Much of what we're doing and proposing with our business plan is very similar to our outdoor pool. It's a lot of the same type of um, mechanicals to the operation of that ice rink, but also in how we staff it for a concession stand and events, event staff itself. And so that process, we're just finishing interviews right now for the pool. Um, and that process started in January, so when the pool opens in um, June. And I believe we have, you have seen this plan as well. Um, talked about, I think, the initial stages of an ice rink and why we'd want that good for economic development, um, really bring an identity to this region, uh, have a full slate of uh, facility use of when we would have open skate, school groups, private rentals, um, et cetera. And then our projected budget, um, based on our, our work with our consultant, um, that helped us kind of identify things that um, we would want in both the design and construction of an ice rink, but also operations. So our base operations our base budget, as we initially constructed it, is showing an $18,000 profit. Um, these are, I think, within the reasonable amounts. And of course, we won't have true great numbers until we went through a season or two. Um, but the way we budget with staff expenses and revenue associated with admissions, rentals, um, passes, uh, special events, um, this looks to be at a minimum break even, and I anticipate um, without full-time staff allocation and benefits to actually make money. Um, in your packet, you have the agreement, and I would entertain any questions on any particulars of the proposed agreement. Um, well, I guess I'll let Doug go first, because he had some sure. comments at uh, Finance and Personnel, and then Aldermore. Huh. So uh, my understanding is this has not been reviewed by the Parks Board? It is not. Is there a reason for that? Timing. Um, at this point, it was, um, we wanted to, I was waiting on revisions to the existing agreement um, and wanted to make sure we were close to where um, the bank was ready to sign, was ready to commit to this overall. I didn't want to take anything to the Parks Board or even to this council if they weren't serious without a signature. Okay. Um, as I said at Finance, I really, uh, I would appreciate having the Parks Board's input on this. I think while we've named facilities in the past, I don't know that we've had a naming rights quite like this. I know we sell advertising at the pool, but this, as I understand it, would be exclusive. Um, if I'm wrong on that, correct me. But um, and I think when we, for example, didn't we when we named the football field the Maury Hawk Reed Field, 
believe that was a recommendation from Parks Board. Um, so I, so on that point, that part of it, I would, I would, at least like to, to have the Parks Board review this. And then I had some questions just on the the financial end of it that Mark is going to be getting for the the next meeting. One was the uh, what what is the present value of ten thousand dollars paid annually over the next. 15 years because while it adds up to $150,000, it's not worth $150,000 today. And then also to put <coughs> a price tag on the number, the, the benefit, the six benefits listed um, in the agreement that MSB would receive. Uh, one is pretty obvious the $2,000 per year facility uh, for facility use of city facilities um, which so that right there would make it a net eight thousand dollar contribution if I'm not, unless I'm not understanding it correctly uh, that's the value of a rental at one of our facilities so we're not giving money back to them it would be the retail value of like a park shelter rental or community center rental um, we don't have any typical hard costs with those type of events okay but <clears throat> would we be foregoing rental revenue that we could otherwise get? Mm -hmm. Possibly, but not necessarily. Okay. Um, we have plenty of off times, non-reserve times at all of our facilities. Okay. But it seems like at least <clears throat> at least part of that would be revenue that we would that we would be foregoing at least some of that. 2,000, whether it's 1,000 or 500, or I don't know what it would be. Potentially. <clears throat> well, right, but I think we could put in a, a, you know, a reasonably expected value of what we would expect if we weren't giving it free to them, what revenue would we expect? And then likewise, I'd ask Mark to, to see about the value of the private skate events, um, the full page ad, the, the youth sports sponsorships, I don't know if that has a monetary value. Um, so that we can basically, so that when we're looking at it, we have what is the actual value of this today, and then what are the value of these things, so we have a net. And if it's, you know, maybe it will be close to 10,000 a year, but so <coughs> we're gonna get that for the next, for our next meeting. Did you have anything else, Doug? Nope. Nancy? And then Chad? Yeah, um, uh, well, a couple of things. One is um, I just want to reiterate something that, that Jake said, which is, um, you know, when, uh, uh, well, first let me reiterate for the record that I been, have been the chair of the ad hoc committee for the Riverfront Park from the get go, and I also serve on the Park and Rec Board. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that there's two things uh, as it relates to this park uh, that are in terms of the goals of this park that are worth reiterating. One is, is that we thought it was really critical for the health of the businesses that are there, as well as for any amount of money that we're spending um, in this development, that it be a year-round destination. Um, uh, unlike uh, most of our other parks um, uh, that really tend to be more seasonal. And so um, it was in fact a unanimous decision to be pursuing this rank by the ad hoc committee. Didn't start out that way, but, um, but and, uh, and it's safe to say too, the developers were really excited because it would be, we would be drawing people to the park. Um, uh, the second thing is um, that from the very beginning, we felt it was really critical to create a really exciting space. And yes, it is more expensive than all of us would like, but we really felt it was critical to create a really exciting space, a very public space, um, uh, so that it is not viewed or used as just a back lawn for the people that live there. And we still hear a lot of that in the community. I know I certainly hear from other people. We heard during the election, 
I hear, you know, I've heard it from business people. Well, it's just going to be used by, it's not going to be used by residents. It's just going to be used by the people who live there. Well, you know, the way to obviously combat that is to, is to develop the kind of park that we think we have. Um, and I also want to thank the ad hoc committee and Jake for all of his work on this and Monona Bank for their interest. Um, I have to say, I feel like this is the first time I'm seeing the business plan. Maybe I was out of town. Um, but I don't know that the business plan has been shared um, with us before, and I don't recall it being shared with the ad hoc committee or with or, or, or with Park and Rec. Um, uh, and I think that's important. Um, I am a little concerned that this proposal kind of puts the cart before the horse um, in that regard, and it goes back to what Doug was saying about the committee. Um, one is the framework for what would be naming rights, um, never mind this specific proposal, was never even discussed in committee. Um, you know, what we think it might take for naming rights, um, uh, what kind of advertising we'd find acceptable, et cetera. And in fact, the ad hoc committee very explicitly and unanimously said they didn't want any advertising on the sideboards, as one example. When, when, when we asked the committee and said, Jake said, do you mind if we have logos of a bunch of different, you know, we need to raise the money for the rink, do you mind if we have logos on the side of this? And the committee unanimously said, absolutely do mind, we don't want that. Um, so so I'm, I'm first concerned that, again, the committee hasn't, you know, never even discussed um, what naming rights might look like or even potential folks to approach besides Monona Bank or, or, or uh, you know, other businesses in town. Um, and in relation to the benefits that they're receiving, I think it's important that people know that Buck and Honey's, as another example, um, from the get-go was really, really pushing to be able to have private events on the lawn in the summer. Specific, you know, the whole floor, one whole floor of Buck and Honey's is for special events and hopefully, um, to their point, a lot of weddings. And so they want to be able to use the lawn for their private events. And again, from the get-go, we've said, not possible. We're not. This is a public. Again, going back to our original goal, this is a public park. It's for public use. We're not going to be doing private events there. So um, and so to say no to Bucking Honeys during the summer, but then all of a sudden say yes to Monona they can have it for private events when again I don't think as committee we've discussed the rink being used we have discussed the concession stand but I don't recall discussing using the rink on a regular basis for private events and in fact in park and rec one of the things that we've talked about as it relates to park use in Monona is the whole issue of how many special events where a whole park is essentially taken over um, are we going to allow in Monona whether it's runs or jogs or bikes or what or Fourth of July festivities, whatever. Fourth of July is different, obviously, um, but we've had we've been having that discussion at Park and Rec, precisely because we know we have beautiful parks. We know we have a lot of people that want to use them, and so how many special events where it becomes a private event where a whole space is taken over, <coughs> is acceptable? And we decided at Park and Rec committee. Generally, I think we just agreed that, you know, we've been, we've been batting that around, but we agreed probably didn't want to do too many because then the public, again, our public, our residents don't get a chance to use it. So, so I'm, I am concerned that in, give, in giving away some private events that we're opening, uh, we're setting a precedent as it relates to Buck and Honeys or potentially other people who wa are going to want to do the same thing on the Great Lawn or in other parts of the park, and there, and then compromises the public, public domain um, that it should be. Um, and then last, uh, as it relates to the terms, I too share some concern um, about the terms. It's not quite last. Um, the length, the length of 15 years, and last, definitely not least, 
Um, it seems to me that the amount of signage that we're talking about, I mean, it, the, the amount of signage that is indicated in this proposal is way, way, way beyond the sign code that we have now and the sign code that as revised that's been expanded um, for any other business here in Monona by far. Um, and really effectively rebrands the space for the winter to something that's not a city space at all but is a, a Monona bank space. And so I, I'm concerned about that too, again, given that we spent close to a year now redoing our sign code. Um, and we've said to people like Buck and Honey's, you can only have two signs, <laughs> just like every other business in Monona. And then on this particular rink, we've got signs all over the rink, signs under the rink, signs at the entrance to the park, signs on the poles, light poles. Um, it just seems um, like more of a stretch than we should be making for this one instance. Um, so, uh, you know, it just it concerns me overall, first and foremost, that the committee hasn't had its chance to take a look at it. Um, and again, it's not that I don't appreciate the amount of work that's gone into it or the fact that we need to raise money for the park. <laughs> Um, but I'm just wondering, too, even in relation to the fact that we just lost the stewardship money, if maybe we should be putting off um, the rink for the first year. We're having a hard time coming up with money uh, as it is um, to finish the park without the rink. I'd hate to do that, but I just throw that out as another factor. Um, that's concerning to me because we have to we have to identify over three hundred thousand dollars of other funds that we no longer have. Right, Jake. Did you have any answers, or does someone else want to say something? I, did you have anything to respond to that? Or I guess I would need clarification. There was a lot of questions and comments and concerns in there. Um, I I can speak to. The ad hoc committee in March um, requested that we pursue naming rights. The Park and Recreation Board during the budget process requested we pursue naming rights for this facility. The mayor requested we pursue naming rights for this facility. I think in any conversation with a potential sponsor, there's negotiations and there's discussions over what those would include. And so my question would be, if you were to want to sponsor this rink, what type of exposure would you be looking at? Um, these are seasonal signs, not permanent signs that we'd be looking at. I think the number can be discussed. Um, I think it's a fairly fair agreement when we're looking at the amount of hard money capital that we're getting paid by an organization um, versus the benefits that we're giving are um, things that we give away all the time. You know, free pool passes or a free park shelter rental for the Friends of the Library fundraiser. Um, we do this type of pro bono trading all the time. So I, I, I would recommend think about that you know, critically if, if this is indeed the route that we want to go with having an ice rink here at this, at this spot. I guess one thing I would say in terms of the rental of the ice rink, I kind of equate that with the rental of the pool. I mean, we rent the pool all the time for private groups. Um, and it wouldn't be renting the entire park, it would just be renting That's correct. Rink. Is that correct? That's correct. Yep. Um. With, any, with any facility, when you look at off times, you look at, um, you know, private rentals. So you got Saturday night at 7 o'clock. Um, 7 o'clock is the time where you typically look at an evening option for private rentals and that's all flexible you know that's flexible to change based on how a season goes we set up a, a schedule based on our vast amount of research on other refrigerator rinks across the country um, we hired a consultant that we bounced our ideas off of in our our plan and you know we come up with a base thing and the great thing about parks and rec when we run Facilities and our programs we change we can change with the times. It doesn't have to be that way, but there's always amount of 
time available. And if we were so busy with open skate at all the times and making a lot of money, we wouldn't need to have private rentals. Chen? Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I would just have to say to the council and to Jake, I mean, I'm, I'm agnostic about whether or not we allow some form of sponsorship for a public facility. It's always a little tricky. I, I hesitate uh, to do it too much. You know, I wouldn't want City Hall to be branded, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but that said, right now the Parks Department has a pretty extensive uh, sponsorship program, and I can speak to this both as the former uh, director of the Parks Board and as a business that has been a platinum sponsor, uh, where we pay $5,000 a year to have our corporate logo on banners at all of the events that happen at the uh, main Winnequa Park. We get branding on some of the baseball jerseys. We get a foursome to the um, the golf outing. I mean, basically a lot of things which are sold individually as sponsorship options. So for example, you could just be a company and probably for a few hundred dollars put your logo on one baseball team or something like That's that. Correct. But if you put all this stuff together in a package, mm -hmm. um, you can <coughs> attract uh, businesses who want to make a bigger commitment to the city and <coughs> get in return for that some benefit. You know, So we would have staff outings at one of the shelters, for example. That's very true. You know, Yes, it was part of that $5,000 that we were paying. Like we were getting all of these things, mm -hmm. but we were also getting some branding recognition, which for many of those things, you are already selling. We as a city are selling those things mm -hmm. and allowing companies to brand themselves. So again, like I'm not saying that therefore we have to allow this particular contract to move forward on this particular part, but it's not inconsistent with some of the things we're doing right now in the city. Okay, I, I, just, I just want to respond because, you know, I've spent the entire, my entire career, my entire life in the nonprofit sector and also in fundraising. So I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't be naming the park or that it's not okay to go out and get corporate sponsorships for things or that we shouldn't be attracting corporate sponsors for things. Um, I just think that there is a pretty big leap for the committee that we're supposed to be using for things to, from just saying, sure, go out and getting naming rights and then hearing radio silence, except for we did see one drawing as it relates to, it was probably a Monona Bank, but radio silence in terms of what that might look like. Uh, and, um, and and I am concerned overall that the brand in the winter becomes very, I mean, to me, the sign just does seem like it's pretty, takes pretty much takes over the park. For instance, the poles around that they, that they want to put banners on, if they have their banners on it, as an example, that would limit what we can do in terms of Christmas decorations because they have their banners on the poles, and so we can't, take their, you know, whatever we might want to do around the holidays or, or, or other special events, we can't use those poles because they have the poles all the time. Just mm -hmm. small things. So I'm just saying, I, I, I t you know, I wish it had gone through the committee and to me it seems like they're, um, it's not, again, it's not that I'm, I've been doing this my whole life. It's not that I'm against corporate sponsorship or corporate America or anything else. I just wish that we had followed the process that we, I thought we had set up. Um. Andrew? Uh, <clears throat> so thanks to you and the mayor or whoever else was involved in at least getting us to where we are you know, today. Um, so, so we did see the operating budget during the budget process last year. So for the ice rink, because I know that was a big discussion on how much would it cost and different things like that. And I'm glad you brought it up again, because actually I had that same question again. Um, I don't think so. I have kind of a couple comments, not really anything in particular. Um, I think uh, people brought up really good questions and uh, concerns. I think. If I'm reading the room, it's probably going to go to Parks Board. So I think this is a good step 
uh, in setting the table for discussions. I don't think, um, I mean, I do agree we did talk about in particular the banners on the boards. I don't necessarily think the Parks Board or the Ad Hoc Committee needs to get into the nitty gritty. Kind of to Chad's point, they're selling these things anyways. You know, hopefully Mary is always in the loop of what's being discussed and negotiated. Um, you know, at some level, the leadership just has to kind of move forward with it. Um, again, I'm not discounting any of the questions, comments, or concerns or anything, but I think, you know, where we're at is a good, good, I won't say starting point, but kind of, again, setting the table for then Parks Board to look at this. Um, one thing uh, we can't do is uh, compare this to, like, the Buck and Honeys. Because the buck and honeys aren't putting up $150,000. The forage is not putting up $100,000. Uh, you know, different things like that. And I think part of that comment is one, I don't think we can compare those. But two, um, I actually lost my train of thought there. So I apologize for that. So I'll just stick with my notes here. Um, uh, the other, so the other, I guess, one of the other points I wanted to make is, you know, Monona Bank has been a strong partner uh, for the city, uh, for the Monona Grove School District. And I think, you know, while this agreement is just for the ice rink, I don't think we can discount all the other things that they will continue to do. I wouldn't be surprised if this still allows them to give to the senior center, to give to, um, you know, other parks and rec events or different things like that. I know. Uh, you know, there's a number of people in line, whether it's the school district or others, that are asking for six-figure gifts from Monona Bank. So I don't want to, you know, discount the amount that they're willing to commit over a large period of time, um, which I think any organization that commits any amount of money over a large period of time, I think, is a great thing because you never know what's going to happen. Um, but they've just been a strong partner. So I guess the point I want to get across is, that, you know, Monona Bank has been a strong partner. Hopefully, you know, this amount means that they're still going to be giving to the senior center and different things like that. So hopefully that was a part of the conversations that you had. Um, uh, and if I come up with what I blanked on before, I will raise my hand again. So, no, I just wanted to say, you know, I think, again, not discrediting any comments or questions. I think. We're in a great place. I'm glad there's a sponsor coming up. I think, you know, maybe a few less, uh, maybe board logos or different things like that. But um, other than that, I think, you know, generally this is a, a, a good agreement. Jen? I just wanted to share one additional concern, and I'm not quite sure how this fits into the planning and the timing. but. I know, for example, when the Remodeling Association does our expo event, you can be a platinum sponsor of that event, and you get your name on the event, and you get all sorts of other things. And the first person that signs up for that gets to do it. Mm -hmm. So one concern that I have that does make me a little uncomfortable as we've been having this conversation is it doesn't sound like you know that is what has happened. I mean, we essentially thought that Monona State Bank was a logical partner and we went to them and you know I doubt Buck and Honey's wants to pony up $150,000 for a 15 year uh, sponsorship but we don't know the answer to that question and frankly we don't know what the value of this thing is because we're not you know we're making we're talking about a 15 year commitment um, there might be a company that's willing to pay $20,000 a year for these naming rights and by essentially making the deal before mm -hmm. we give an opportunity for other people to come forward, we might be cutting ourselves out of some potential additional revenue. Now, I mean, perhaps it's a small point, but I do think that there's something to be said for transparency and an opportunity like this. You know, I mean, Miller Park was just recently, obviously, you know, they sold the naming rights. And I know companies go to the, the ballpark and the county and they negotiate, they make mm -hmm. offers. I mean, I don't think the city of Monona has said, you know, we're accepting offers for sponsorship of this park, but I do think we would serve ourselves well to allow that 
behind the scenes conversation to happen. And is that how these things usually are done? I, I don't know. Brian, do you have anything to add? <coughs> no, each, each one of these facilities is unique in the, the process by which uh, <coughs> community gets to that decision is depending on the, the corporate uh, community that is located within that community. So it's, it's really tough to say that there's a one best way to, to do this type of process. I mean, if you put, you know, an RFP <coughs> or RFQ out, you know, would you get any response? I, I, I'm not sure. It's, um, it's, it's tough. Jen? Um, and then Doug? I'm, this is probably a rookie question, but I'm curious as to why the council's being asked to approve this type of an agreement when we aren't, like we don't see the $5,000 agreements that presumably, you know, like Chess Design Build enters into with their sponsorship at the pool. Like what's the threshold or why, why this one? Is it because it's the new park or? I guess I assume it's because it includes the naming rights? Correct, it would be the naming of the ice rink, the facility within the park. Now I don't know, I'm just thinking about the library, the quiet reading room, for instance. Metcalf's donated $100,000, and I don't, I'm trying to think back when we did that whole um, process. I mean, the, the boardroom over here is the Bowles boardroom or whatever. Um, if they, I think we had different values assigned to different rooms, but I don't think the council necessarily approved that. Of course, the library board's a little bit different than park board, too, so. Doug? So uh, I think in relation <coughs> to that, there, at some point, there was a policy adopted for naming of uh, facilities, started at the library, and then the, the, there is a policy for parks. And um, I guess the question would be, I mean, I think it's great that a, a business like Chad's or, or Monona Bank can, um, whoever can spot, you know, is willing to sponsor these events and see benefit in, in doing it. But, but I think they should be in adherence to existing policy. And I guess I go back in this, for this agreement, I, I want to hear from either the Parks Board or, or the Facilities Board I, um, on some of the details facilities <coughs> committee might be better, but I, I <coughs> so I don't know. Is there a problem with with taking the time to have the parks board look at it? I would like to do so before the next council meeting. Like I said, we're at a point now where. Um, well, you're asking us to adopt an agreement. That, yeah. With a term of 15 years, and we don't have time to go to the parks board. No, I'm saying we do. I'll just have to oh, call a special meeting because I would like to have this council consider it at the next council meeting the first meeting in May and we're not scheduled to meet till the second Tuesday in May okay and in all their so well that's to. mainly for a timing issue at this point of being able to get if if this council wants to see ice skating for this season in November we would have to start that process in May for bidding out the equipment for supply and installation. We're kind of at that point now. And you don't think we could wait until a second council meeting in May, which would be after the Parks Board meeting? It's cutting it really close. Um, no, I, okay. If it has to be a special meeting that, that I mean, at least for me, I can't, I won't support it without it having been reviewed. So I don't know if we want a formal motion to refer it to the Parks Board and see if anybody else. I think we've done that in the past, haven't we? Yeah. Did, first of all, did anyone else have anything else to say? I, I just wanted to say that I wasn't uh, uh, saying that Buck and, Buck and Honey's was going to come up with 150 grand. What I was saying is that he's apt to, you know, come to us as he already has. He's apt to come to us and say, you know, if my clients are willing to plunk down another thousand dollars for the great lawn for their wedding, can I have it? And we haven't established, to the best of my knowledge, a policy around uh, or had much of a discussion around whether or not 
I mean, the ad hoc committee has said they don't want to use that on a regular. But how is that any different than somebody saying, I want to do a birthday party in the ice rink, or Minota Bank saying, I want to do a private party in the ice rink? So um, the difference being, obviously, in Minota Bank's case, that they're, they're going to get it as a Benny. But I'm just saying, in general, the volume of private rentals is something that's going to obviously not going to just occur with the ice rink. It's also going to occur on the Great Lawn in the summer. And I think before we get there, we should probably talk about how much we don't or do or don't want that to happen as a park board because I'm sure it's going to be an attractive space and people are going to want to rent it. <laughs> And the money is really tempting. I know as somebody that rented out their facility on a regular basis when I lived in Chicago, it's really tempting. It's, you know, but then it doesn't become a public space. Anyone else? Yeah. Doug, did you? Um, so it sounds like that the use of the Great Lawn is probably a good something else for Parks Board to talk about in the future, but. Yeah, we'll the say policies, re I mean, both Parks Board and Ad Hoc, I think it was fairly clear in our discussions that we wouldn't be renting it out for private okay. events in the summertime. It would be used for public events, Park and Rec right. sponsored events. Um, but certainly we'll be looking at, you know, policies regarding use, mm -hmm. et cetera. But you know, with a proposed open date of July 1st, I'm not necessarily inclined to say, let's set policy in stone for this facility until we go through a, a cycle of a season to see how it operates, you know, or we can say no, you know, I mean, the, the first answer is no to most of it that is open to the public. Um, sands when we have an ice skating rink, you know, there the park is still open to the public. Um, there right. will be times where there's general skate, but you know, even with the ice rink, it would be admission based to the skating rink. It won't be just free, you know, come and skate. Mm -hmm. Um, it will be an admission-based um, rink. Okay. Then with that, I'll move to refer this to Parks Board. I'll second that. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is approved. Thank you, Jake. Next item is reports. Alder Spate, in honor of this being your last meeting, we'll let you report first. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> well, uh, first let me say that the library uh, board and all the volunteers for the library, the various foundations, are having their appreciation event on Thursday night. Uh, so um, if you were involved in the library, please come out. Um, I don't have any other committee reports, but I just want to thank all of you for your uh, generosity and kindness uh, during some difficult periods in, in my life and my family's life. Um, it has been hard to give this council the time that it deserves, but I leave this council knowing that all of you give the time that it needs, and I am uh, excited and looking forward to what Monona will continue to grow and become. Uh, under your leadership and um, when you ever want for me to show up and make a comment at the podium you've got my email so I will gladly stay active uh, to the best of my ability thank you thanks sir Alder Moore thank you nothing to report Alder Groupie um oops, hold on I gotta get my notes here um, with regard to the library, the One Community Many Voices Oral History Initiative is still ongoing and just starting to make strides. So um, Director, Claring will, Director Claring will urge that if you are able to volunteer to either collect or share stories uh, as part of the, pro the project and as members of the Monona community, um, they are looking actively for people to do both of those jobs. Um, another note, uh, Tony Streckert, um, the Information uh, Services Coordinator who has held that position for the past seven years, 
Um, also the creator of many, the majority of the library's adult programs is retiring on May 31st. So I wanted to make that announcement um, and just make a note that, you know, she has been really vital to providing exceptional programming and services uh, for many years for the library um, and will be missed and should be recognized for her work. So. Jan? Um, I'd like to thank this group for allowing my tardiness this evening. Um, I was enjoying a lovely concert from the uh, Monona Public School District uh, choral concert. Um, so thank you. Um, but I have nothing else to report. Alder Kitzler. Um, so at Parkers Rec, we had a nice presentation by the Monona Sailing Club on a potential regatta coming in 2021 or 2022, depending uh, if a certain sailboat, which I think Nancy probably knows, like an M2 or something, I don't know, um, <laughs> might be allowed into the Olympics, which then would be kind of a boon to this opportunity. So we're really looking forward to that potential opportunity years, years from now. But it was nice that they kind of gave us the heads up, uh, you know, three Wait, years. Did you know that time. Monona is a sailing mecca? And we learned that from the yeah. sailing club. We didn't yeah. know that. Did. Seriously, among racers, it's like. Uh, Lake Monona is a great place, yeah. yeah. Um, and then kind of in conjunction with that, uh, Parks and Rec Board is talking about Stonebridge, kind of renovation and remodel, if you will. Um, and how that will kind of partner with REACH 64 and what we might have to do with mitigation of phosphorus and different things like that. Um, so for all those viewers, including Bob Miller, check that out. And then Woodland Park, um, John and Peggy Traver, as we all know, are doing a lot of work there. Um, so they're actually helping um, financially and otherwise with kind of a, a plan of adding some trails and a parking lot and just really kind of increasing accessibility there. In addition, I believe, Nancy, he paid for those signs. Mm -hmm. There's going to be some new signs that are going up throughout the park that are now made of metal so they don't get burned uh, during the, well, they might get burned, but they won't actually burn down like a couple of the signs have been <laughs> um, when they do the kind of prairie fire forest burns and such like that. So certainly thanks goes out to the Travers, but I just thought of those kind of three quick things that were kind of highlights of our mm -hmm. meetings in the last few weeks. Alderwood. A um, <clears throat> couple things from uh, Landmarks Commission. May 8th, Joe DeRose of the Wisconsin Historical Society uh, will be speaking in this room at 6 o'clock about the National Register of Historic Places including some discussion not just of the program and um, but also of the potential for tax credits if you have one of those and then on <clears throat> May 18th in the forum room at time hasn't been set for sure either 1 or 1 30 most likely will be a dedication of the Monona mound formerly known as the Rindall mound but uh, with Bob Birmingham, the former uh, state archaeologist, and Janice Rice, who was the archivist for the Ho-Chunk Nation, will be speaking at that with light refreshments. What's the so date on that again? May 18th. May 18th. That's a Saturday. And what time? Um, we haven't set for sure. I one, Let's say 1.30. We have the room from 12 to 3, but I... I don't know, but we want to start earlier than 1 or 1.30, so. Um, that's all I had on that, and it's just, I'd just say it's going to be really weird to sit here and look down the table and not not have Chad at, at our meetings or have Chad in a box on the, <laughs> on the table. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Um, You'll, you'll definitely be missed here, and uh, it's been, been a lot of fun. Thank you. And the last thing I would say is McKeever doesn't require that we invite him to come. He just comes and speaks. Right. So <laughs> I think he sets a good example. Yes, thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Joan? Um, there was no recount, so um, I don't have a report. Okay. Uh, just briefly, our new city planner, Douglas Plowen, will be starting uh, tomorrow with the city, so we're happy to have him on board. Mm -hmm. All right. 
Um, I just had a couple things. Uh, remember that tomorrow night is our organizational meeting at 5.30, followed by dinner at SWAD. Uh, your significant others are welcome to join us. If you'd like, I will be sending, um, I have done some rearranging of committees, um, and I will be sending out those, uh, what the appointments will be sometime tomorrow, and we'll be voting on those uh, tomorrow night. And the, the appointments will go into effect with the May meeting of that committee. Um, I again would remind people out there, we are still looking for people to apply for, we've got spots open in I think three or four committees. Um, still, we filled some of the spots, but uh, so please go to the city website. There's a link right there. I think the first uh, thing listed under city news is that we're looking for people to apply. So if you click on that, it'll lead you to a, a page with the uh, application uh, form to send in. Um, I guess the only other thing is, Chad, uh, again, we'll miss you. Uh, as I said the other night, um, we'll miss your out-of-the-box thinking and creativity and your passion for what you believe in. And But I am appointing Chad to Public Works tomorrow, so <laughs> he uh, will be continuing to champion sidewalks uh, in days to come. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? Move. So moved. Moved. Oh. There's a second. I'm going to give it to Chad. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you.